people live in the emotional realm. They live in a future hope, but they don't understand. I think they need to understand that the way God declares a thing, it may not make sense to you. And I can't tell you how much, uh, 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 or forgive me, the war that's within, quote, professing Christendom with everything from replacement theology, the Zionist, you know, issue and everything. And, and here's what people don't understand. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And I, what, what's astonishing to me is the fact that, and, and look, you said something that I think we really, if God would grant us the greatest gift tonight, that he could grant the world of listeners, that they, the, the spirit of the living God, God would run to the, the Lord's children, those who call him Savior, the spirit of the fear of the Lord, because there is no departing from evil without that. And so when Absolutely. you hear what you did at the top of the hour when we began, in a nutshell, I mean, if anybody doesn't understand what Jesus has said, it's really easy. I believe that the Jesus of of history, that the Jesus who is our Savior, that because the church has so fouled the waters for others to drink of the Spirit of God, because and that which calls itself the church, because everybody in the world has an opinion and has misrepresented him, you know, I see in the scripture, it says, let God arise and his enemies be scattered. And I've often mm, thought before yes. that means in the world, it has to be in the light. You, can, you know, as you walk and as you obviously have uh, obeyed the voice of calling in your life, what do you see as the single biggest hindrance, uh, you know, to the people that you minister to, that you teach in Bible so that Bible classes around the world, where is the fear of the Lord, in your opinion? Because I would say this, Sister Arlene basically had the uh, pronunciation or the enunciation from the Lord God of Heaven himself that I am now ready to do battle. Is that an accurate statement? Mm-hmm. Uh, that's very accurate. Uh, she said he, he looks so powerful and... Uh, she said, I cannot, I cannot even begin to describe how fearful he looked. He looked so fearful in his awesomeness of his power. And uh, I, I tell you, it, uh, you know, I, I fear, see, Steve, that one of the things we've replaced, uh, we've replaced true worship with uh, an entertainment spirit. Uh, our worship is not, not worship. It's, it, our praise is not praise. It's, it's too many of our leaders in our churches are promoting themselves and their own gifts and their own talents. Uh, and that is so dangerous because uh, these kind of songs come forth literally out of purpose and out of focus. And... Uh, it just uh, uh, the, the kind of words that they're singing so much now is touch me, bless me, heal me, deliver me, 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 you know. And that is not worship. That is, that is give me, give me, give me, give me. And the church doesn't seem to realize it. Uh, if people are wondering what I'm saying, see if, if what I'm saying isn't true. Judge it by yourself. I don't want to be the judge. I have no desire to be the judge. I want to be a witness. But judge for yourselves. When you come into church and you're into the lobby, into the entryway, and and you men, you get together and you come and you meet one another, yet perhaps haven't seen each other all week. And uh, what are some of the first expressions that you express I know what I, I know what I've observed as I'm setting up materials in the lobby. Many times, CDs and DVDs and books. Uh, I watch how people walk in the door in their spirit, and I see it so common. I see men like put their fists together, you know, thrust their fists together, and say, "Wow, man, wasn't that an awesome game last night? Or wasn't that something else the other day, man? Did you see that pass? Did you see that shot? Uh, did you see that putt go in, man? Did you see that 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 kick?" Um, and it's their first word, Steve. And they don't seem to realize 
as you said, and as we've been speaking, the fear of God is not in that expression. The excitement of the sports of this world. And because of that, we're seeing more and more uh, players carried off the court and off the field with serious injuries. And uh, God is not blessing it. We're seeing more and more corruption in it among the coaches, among the promoters, and among the players. And uh, it's really sad that we have to take something like that and uh, turn it into that. But it, it's a strong indicator of the condition of the church. Professionalism seems to have taken over. Uh, in little churches, I go to little churches as well as big ones, and little churches many times... They just simply play a CD of music, and the people sing along with it. But you know what? Once that CD stops, their their singing, their worship stops. And it's like they can't carry it on without a promotion, without someone to provoke them. And uh, I think the reason that this is going on is because the church has lost its its closet. It has forsaken its prayer closet. It's secret time individually with the Lord. And it's in that time where we really gain our strength. We expect to gain our strength from the pastor and from the praise service. And I hear it all the time, complaints about the, the speaking or complaints about the music, complaints about how loud it is or what it is or it isn't. And... That's sad. That's sad. Where is the excitement about Jesus? Jesus should be the focus of this gathering and of the, the thing whole that, purpose of our life. Excuse me. The thing that oh, I think you. is, uh, you know, just talking about this, I don't know, you know, when when people remember the old days when you went down the altar one way and you got up a different Way you went down oh, the yeah. center and right and a rose, forgive me, a saint. I I am praying for the words of the Lord. By the way, Henry, I, I can say this now. I think with Doug's amen, and, and and I'm not looking for him, but you know we talk off the air, and I would say this. I would say it's a safe thing to bet that 80 percent of the millions of people that listen to this broadcast, especially when we're talking about the things of God. Are, are basically unchurched. That when I say that, they they don't go there anymore because they they acknowledge the problem, but they don't mm-hmm. know where to go to be fed. And I'm telling you this: I see tonight's broadcast as I do every time that Pastor Langford is on or I'm on to get to talk about Jesus, as literally the Lord sending His word out on the highways and byways and compelling people to come in. I know this: I may be, uh, let's just say this, a permanent orange light in some cases, but the point is, I'm smart enough by the grace of God to understand that Jesus never quit redeeming people, he never quits healing people, he never quits, and and that's the thing that is fascinating to me, because contrast the American Christian church, the American Christian expression, with, for instance, when, when you're in you know, the heart of Muslim country, and yet people are here who know that there are people that will kill them just for their belief, but they're hungry for Jesus. Share your experience on this last, I call it your missionary journey. Uh, you know, just compare and contrast the hunger, uh, what it means to these people to come into the knowledge that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God and that he will forgive them of their sins and fill them with the Holy Spirit. That the contrast, Henry, I would think would have to be the most pronounced to you as opposed to uh, most people because you live in that. You, you go to the third world. You're, you're always walking someplace with the good news of Jesus. Yet it's almost like in America, and I've said this and I stand behind the statement, don't get mad at Henry, but there is no name more uh, hated, more reviled, more uh, avoided, more mocked, more, nor snickered at, snickered at in the name of Jesus. And by the way, that's in the church. Yeah, yeah, I hear what you're saying. So, I hear what so you're saying. And, when and you that go into sad. these places, and, yeah. people don't realize when they take professionalism 
and they lean upon the arm of their professional, of, of using the, the gift with instruments and their voices that God gave them. You know, Elvis, take Elvis Presley, for example. Elvis Presley, Jerry Lee Lewis, uh, these kind of people, they grew up in the Spirit-filled church. They literally grew up in the Spirit-filled church. Elvis Presley learned to play guitar. I knew his pastor as a young man. I knew him personally. And uh, he, his pastor became a missionary to Africa after Elvis became famous. And uh, then he retired in the days of Elvis being famous. And uh, Elvis called on him several times. And he told me personally, his pastor told me personally, he told me how, he said, Elvis said, you know, Pastor, he said, I remember those days when I, I learned to play guitar in the church. And I wanted to play it so bad. I wanted to learn it so bad so I could be a part of, of, of the worship service. I, I wanted to be a part of that. And everybody said I had a good voice and, and they wanted me to be a part of it. And so I really worked at it. And then when I, uh, when I achieved it, uh, then the world, they began to, they wanted to do a recording of me and a Christian label and then I went on that, uh, old, whatever it was, Ed Sullivan program and won that and boy, I was in there then. And, uh, but he said, I lost Jesus. I lost Jesus. I can still sing the songs. I get a good, uh, a good lively quartet to back me up for the gospel songs because I'm literally riding on the strength of those four men and their singing, not on my own anymore. I'm hollow. I feel empty. And I really wonder how many of you out there, if, if perhaps this is beginning to be the feeling in you, uh, I think let, let me just give you a little understanding or ask you a few questions to, to judge yourself before you get up in front of the congregation to lead in praise and worship. Do you understand praise? Do you understand thanksgiving? Do you understand worship? Do you understand the scriptures as we'll enter his gates with thanksgiving, his courts with praise, and into the Holy of Holies with worship? Do you understand the preparation that's required in that? And do you prepare your heart before the Lord, before you go up in front of the congregation, realizing you have a tremendous responsibility before Almighty God to, to lead the people into triumph, and into victory. If you need a good scripture for that, go to Second Chronicles chapter 20, where Jehoshaphat feared the Lord and set his heart to seek the Lord and declared a fast. And when these nations of Ammon and Moabites and Ammonites and Hittites, when they're coming up against him, nations that are greater and mightier than him, he set his heart to seek the Lord, proclaimed a fast, and, and then the Lord set his prophet there. And his prophet said, you don't even need to fight, you know, but stand still and see the salvation of God with you. Because he feared the Lord. Well, what then kind of instruction did he get? The instruction he got then in that Second Chronicles chapter 20 was to put the praisers, the, the ones that praise the beauty of holiness, put them out between the two armies, lead them out before Judah. Lead them out there before Jehuda, Judah, because Jehoshaphat was the king of Judah. And, and so he sent the praisers, the worshipers, and Judah means praise. And he sent them out between the two armies. And the scriptures are very clear that when they began to praise the sing and to praise the beauty of holiness, the Lord set ambushments against them. I think if the church will come back to genuine worship and praise with really taking this thing seriously, and the people will not come to church to be built up and encouraged, but will come to church to be an encouragement and a building up of others already built up, already coming out of their prayer closets, I believe we will begin to see a glorious church, and people will not leave the church then. They will not be able to wait until the next meeting. And uh, 
with anticipation of, of coming unto the presence of Almighty God, because God manifests among His people. He loves to manifest among His people. And uh, I can't think of a better year than this year for that to begin to be fulfilled. Uh, think about it. Uh, manifestations, the word manifestations has 14, 14 letters in it. Uh, think about that, you know. Jesus wants to manifest. Hallelujah. And then the other the other word that we have that has 14 letters is transformation. If Amen. we began our manifestations in the Lord, transformation, which has 14 letters, will come about. This is the year for manifestations. This is a year for transformation. I believe with all of my heart... Uh, I think about what we're looking at in Matthew chapter 1. We've got three sets of of 14s, 14 generations, three sets of 14 generations coming in to bring forth Jesus Christ. What is that? What's the significance of this number 14? Why? I mean, what is it so significant that everybody's seeing all these things like we got two blood moons going to take place? And it's so rare for those to occur because they're occurring on feast days. Well, I don't know, but I know one thing. The Lord wants to manifest. And in animal husbandry and breeding of animals, it takes 14 generations. That's a historical scientific fact. It takes 14 generations of breeding to bring forth a pure bloodline. Well, look, at we've got the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and we've got three sets of 14s. So there is the signature of God in bringing forth Jesus Christ. And in Romans chapter 8, it says the whole creation is groaning and travailing, waiting for the manifestation or manifestations of the sons of God. Who are the sons of God? I'm not going to go deep and way out and bizarre like I've seen in my life of walking the world with some people that were so full of pride, declaring themselves a manifested son of God. I don't, I don't even want to go in that. Uh, But I just want to stay to Romans 8, verse 14. There's that 14 again. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. And it is so important to be led by the Spirit of God. I I just came from Taiwan and Malaysia and Singapore. And uh, people were calling me before I went into Malaysia and saying, do you realize they're beheading people, they're abducting people, and and they're, they're demanding high ransoms for them. And, and if they don't get what they want, they, they take their head off. And sometimes after they get the money, they take their head off anyway. And, Henry, what do you want to go in there for? And uh, I've had to tell some of my people, that pray for me, listen, have I ever backed out when there's danger? Do you know me to back out because of danger? No. That's the place where the Lord is needed to be introduced the most, is where the the danger is the greatest. I believe that with all of my heart. And so, staying in your prayer closet, staying in that secret place of the Most High, Abiding under the shadow of the Almighty, in Psalms 91, talks about dwelling in that secret place, the dwell time, dwelling, not just, Lord bless me, my mom, my wife, my my children, and, and my neighbor, and amen, but dwelling in His presence and communing with Him. When you do that, then He relates, He 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 imparts to you something that that you can go by. I told those people when I arrived in Malaysia, uh, they said, are you afraid to go out into this area because it is very dangerous? And uh, the missionary said to me, and I said, no, but I will tell you this. Here's the only thing that I will, that I will use as an indicator. If I lose peace, I will say, let's get out of here. If I lose peace. 
And you that know me, my word, you know that that's way back in 1961 of January that the Lord spoke to me. And he said, start walking. That's the first time in my life that he said to me to walk. Start walking. I'll give you peace, and I'll give you a song. If at any time you lose peace and you can't remember the song, stop, go back, and find the peace in the song. Well, peace is walking with Jesus, and song is worship and praise and thanksgiving. Hallelujah. 